Sir Michael Berry is one of the greatest physicists in the world. He is a recipient of the Lawrence Medal, the Dirac Medal, and the Ig Nobel Prize. And I was able to predict exactly why he had to tune his magnetic field so precisely in order to get this frog to lift, because it never happened before. In 2000, together with Nobel laureate Andre Geim, he conducted the first experiment on the magnetic levitation of a frog. He is the originator of the Berry phase, a cornerstone of quantum mechanics. I would be happy, I wrote, to be the first human to be levitated in this way. Sir, it's a great honor having you here. And my first question to you is, how did the idea of levitating frog experiment, which you co-created, come about? I was fascinated by a scientific toy called the Levitron, where a spinning top, which is magnetized, hovers above a magnetized base in apparent violation of an old theorem which says that uh, no static magnet or object activated on by electric or gravitational force can be stable in three dimensions, but this is. I saw this toy in a toy shop in Zurich. It has a nice name, AHA. It's, I think, the best scientific toy shop in the world and I immediately wanted to understand it. And I realized quite quickly, it was a macroscopic version of the types of microscopic traps in which people hold particles. And I made the theory of this top and it became popular. I was invited to give talks in different places. And in one place, the, one, one of my hosts said, do you know that there's a guy in Nijmegen who's levitated a frog? And I said, no, I don't know about this. And he gave me a link. This was in the early days of the internet. And uh, I saw this frog and I got in contact with the guy, Andre Geim, who later got the Nobel Prize for graphene, right? I had met him before. I really realized he was a very clever guy. And he was studying solid state magnetism in Nijmegen. And then he, I made contact with him and he had this very powerful magnet and uh, he which had the unusual features that it did not need to be at low temperatures and it, it did not need to be in a vacuum and he thought I wonder if I put a diamagnetic object water is diamagnetic which should be repelled as is well known but very weak in this field and maybe even a living creature which is mostly water he put this frog in liberty, but he didn't understand how it worked. And I realized that the theory I had made for this toy applied almost directly to his experiment that he had done. Instead of a spinning top, diamagnetism is rotating electrons in an atom. So this, this, this doesn't matter. And I was able to predict exactly why he had to tune his magnetic field so precisely in order to get this frog to lift. He didn't just put it there and it lived, it was difficult. And so I did the theory and he had done the experiment and he hadn't written it as a paper. So we decided to write a paper together. He had done the experiment and I did the theory and so on. The, the problem is it's easy to create a field where magnetism balances gravity, but that's not enough. It has to be in a region where the equilibrium is stable. It could be in equilibrium, but not be stable. And that's very, a very precise few millimeters. Anyway, we wrote this paper and then uh, he called me one day and he said, there's this guy in America who has invited me to accept the Ig Nobel Prize, Mark Abrahams. I've since become friendly with him. How shall I respond, he said. Is it really a joke? I said, well, it has a humorous aspect, but it isn't a joke. I mean, it's serious science that he, that he um, supports and recognizes. And so if you happen to be anywhere near Harvard when they have this rather stupid ceremony, go, go there. But instead of taking my advice, he replied to Mark Abrahams, 
I will accept this, but only if you give it to Berry as well, because he did the theory and we yeah. did this together. And this is what happened. That I didn't go to, the, to uh, Harvard because I was in Crimea at that time, different re, for a different reason. After the Ig Nobel business, I was visiting him in Manchester, where he moved to and he is now. And uh, he, he uh, had discovered graphene, but nobody knew about it. it was sort of, and he said, I, I want to tell you something amazing. I've discovered the thinnest substance known the most flexible substance known, the strongest substance known, the most impenetrable substance known. And I replied to him with a quotation, so with a statement that he likes to quote when he thinks it will embarrass me. I said, you have invented the material for the perfect condom. <laughs> anyway, so no, this was much later. Was this experiment the first in the history when a living complex organism levitated? I don't know. The first one that I know, it, it, I, would, I never thought about this, but I would say probably. Probably. Yeah. Can a human be levitated using the same technology formally, well, I, theoretically? I, I wrote this in our paper. I was interested because we had all kinds of very strange mail. And one was from a guy uh, in, in, the, in Bath. He said, I'm a Danish man, but I run this church the Church of the Latter-day Snakes. And he said, I wonder if I could levitate in front of my congregation while I'm giving a talk, while giving a sermon. He asked us, he said, he said, would it, would it work? Would I have to be naked? Would I, a very curious question. And so we replied, in principle it would, but I think nobody has created a magnetic field, not only a magnetic field, and the field gradient, this is important, over a big enough area to levitate a human. So in principle, yes, and I would be happy, I wrote, to be the first human to be levitated in this way, but uh, uh, at the moment we can't do it. It would be an unusual kind of levitation because when you're levitating, for example, in a spacecraft, it's because the balance of forces is uniform across the body. With magnetic levitation, it will never be quite uniform, and in particular, different parts of your body are differently diamagnetic. So we're mostly water, our skeleton is not, so you would be held up by your water and your skeleton would hang down. And I speculated that this would be a very unusual kind of facelift therapy, where your skeleton skull was down but your skin and flesh was lifted slightly I mean, there'd be small effects but it would be interesting to know what this would feel like we can't imagine it so it's not it would be levitation you wouldn't fall down but it would be levitation in, at the moment it's uh, at, we're levitated from the ground by our skeleton and our skin and flesh fall down this would be the opposite it would be very interesting. So the answer is, in principle, yes, but we haven't done it. This is what the frog must have felt. Different parts of the frog would have been slightly differently levitated. Which theoretical considerations prompted you to investigate possibility of, of this experiment? I didn't investigate it. He did it completely independently of me. I had studied this scientific toy. Uh, I knew nothing about levitating frogs. He had thought, I wonder if I could levitate water. And then, and he, he indeed did levitate water droplets, you can see. But he realised that living things are mostly water. My contribution was to understand what he had done, because he didn't realise why he had to tune his magnetic field so sensitively, otherwise it would fall down or slip off to the side. And so on. it's exactly what I'd done with this top, how I'd explained it. And the, the theory is not quite the same, but it's almost the same. So uh, I didn't think of it. Uh, I, I, my motivation was seeing this toy in the, in, the, in the toy shop and being fascinated by it, wanting to know how it worked. And how 16 Tesla uh, yeah. machines was created? Oh, he could, well, it was just a, ah, it's an electromagnet. And uh, for this, in the town of Nijmegen in, in Netherlands, he used a substantial fraction, I think it's something like 6% of the electricity supply of the city. So he could only do his experiments at times 
when people in the city were not cooking their dinners and using their electric power at a maximum. So it's, they're just it's straightforward electromagnets, but very powerful ones with coils. What was, you know, the principal uh, physics rules that enable a stable levitation? Ah, um, it's basically because the theorem that says you can't applies to static objects. And it looks as though the frog is more or less static and they're spinning top, but no, they're spinning and with the frog it's diamagnetism and uh, it, 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 the theorem doesn't apply in that case. It almost applies, and, uh, but it doesn't quite. So, so fine, delicate properties of the magnetic field and how it changes with distance above the magnet are necessary in order to get this stability. It's quite a tricky little calculation in stability theory. So it's a piece of dynamics, that's basically what it was. I need to ask you what was happened with the frog. The frog seemed to be hum, unharmed. Didn't, yeah, it was just a little frog, not a big, a little one. It seemed to be uh, unharmed, you know. It, obviously it was surprised and because it never happened before, you know, you see, if you've seen the video, you see it sort of moving around. But uh, no, it was, um, it wasn't harmed. I've been working a long time on what people say is the most difficult unsolved mathematical problem. What the magic mirror is. Wait. The yeah, back. it's amazing. That's why physics is like sex? Yes, indeed. <laughs>